He's leaving. Hey, folks. Welcome to Book Chatter Live. I am your host, Stacey Cochran, and we're joined on the uh, Google Hangout tonight by an outstanding panel of authors and publisher, editor. Uh, so to get things started, uh, we have John Horner Jacobs. Uh, let's see if I can figure out how to bring up this picture here. We have John Horner Jacobs, uh, Joel Charbonneau, uh, Steve Weddle, and Ben Leroy. Uh, maybe, uh, John, start us off by talking a little bit about your your books. You're the author of Southern Gods, The Dark Earth, and a YA series, and a to-be-published fantasy series as well. So tell us a little bit about Southern Gods. Uh, Southern Gods is my first book. It's sort of a crime noir meets uh, a Lovecraft story and sort of a Southern Gothic. Um, uh, that's, you know, that's about it. It's about, it's set in 1951 about a blues man whose music reputedly causes insanity. And uh, it's about a World War II veteran who goes and tries to find the pirated radio station that's broadcasting the music. Excellent. We're also joined on the line, as I said, by uh, Joelle Charbonneau. She's the author of uh, the Testing Trilogy, as well as the Rebecca Robbins and Glee Club Page Marshall mystery series. Uh, so which of those mystery series, Joelle, was the first one to come out? And uh, tell us a little bit about the testing as well. Uh, the Rebecca Robbins mysteries was my, uh, were my first published books, or at least Dating Around the Law. And... Um, they're based in with a roller rink setting and and are goofy and fun. And uh, the Glee Club series was next, which is my singing dancing background in mysteries. And then I I moved into the testing trilogy, which is likened to the SATs meets the Hunger Games, so a little less light and fun and a little more intense. Who knew young adult could be so violent? Can we um can we also just take a second to congratulate Joelle on uh, her big news uh, regarding the testing series? Can you please share that with the class? You really had to go there, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Uh, uh, the, the, the testing will, will hit the New York Times list uh, uh, this week. So, hooray. Awesome. Hooray. Congratulations. Hey, it goes to the New York Times bestseller list. Hoorah. So we're also uh, joined by Steve Weddle. He's uh, kind of back for an encore performance. Speaking of New York Times, um, since our last episode... Uh, with Steve, uh, you had a review, a, a, a damn glowing review uh, in uh, the New York Times. So, so tell us a little bit about Country Hardball and, um, you know, what that's like to see a review in the New York Times of your work. Uh, well, it was very nice. They had some nice things to say, and I actually have that tattooed on my back here. I don't know if you can see the words, but I tattooed some of the reviews on my back. Um, so I thought that was very nice of them. Uh, no, the book is a, uh, a, a pitched as uh, rural noir. It's about a guy who uh, has had some bad things happen to him, and he goes back to his hometown to try to get his life back together. It's called Country Hardball, and uh, it was put out by Mr. Ben Leroy over there, whichever way he is, from the uh, Tyrus Books folks who were nice enough to get it in all the right hands, including the New York Times and other folks. So that's their doing. And we'll just toss it over to Ben. So Ben, uh, we've known one another, uh, you know, through BoucherCon for a number of years. Uh, I think I first met you at a Bleak House Books party in Madison, Wisconsin, many years ago. So tell us a little bit about Bleak House Books, and of course you're now, you know, uh, running Tyrus Books. So so tell us a little bit about both of those. Do you remember was the Bleak House party at our office or was it a bar? It was at your, it was like at a house. I guess it was your yeah, office. Yeah, yeah, and we had the grill going, and we were making food for everybody. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, that was, that was awesome. Uh, yeah, so I started Bleak House Books back in 2000 and ran that until 2005, sold it to a larger company called Big Earth Publishing, had a uh, disagreement about the future of publishing, in 2009 and left Bleak House to start Tyrus. Been running Tyrus since 2009. Sold it to F&W Media in 2011. And through all of that growth, we've had the opportunity to publish a lot of great authors like Mr. Weddle. And uh, life is good. Very cool. 
Uh, so again, you're watching uh, Book Chatter Live. I'm your host, Stacey Cochran, and we're joined on the line tonight by John Horner Jacobs, who's the author of Southern Gods, This Dark Earth, uh, the YA series featuring 12, The Twelve-Fingered Boy, which has just been released recently. Uh, and there's a couple of more books in that uh, series as well coming out. Uh, looks like The Shibboleth and The Conformity. Uh, we are also joined by Joel Charbonneau, who's the author of The Testing Trilogy, uh, Steve Weddle, who's the author of Country Hardball, and Ben Leroy, who is the publisher of Tyrus Books. So, uh, John and Steve, you guys founded, uh, you work on Needle Magazine together. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the origins there. How did you guys meet, and how did, you know, where was the, uh, how did Needle begin? John, you want to take that, or you want me to? No, no, Steve, it's your baby. <laughs> It's, it's well, I, I don't know if it's, it's all of our baby. Uh, I had an idea uh, to see some stories in print because what was happening, as we all know, is uh, especially a few years ago, uh, we would have these great short stories out there. We would read them. They'd be on the screens for a few days. We'd pass around links, and then you know, to a certain extent, they would kind of disappear. So it was important to me uh, to kind of get that as ink on paper. Uh, I was a big fan of Crime Spree magazine, which uh, John and Jordan and uh, those folks put out. And uh, I called uh, John uh, and asked him some questions. Uh, and asked him to talk me out of the idea. He he didn't. Uh, gave me some great advice. Just I mean, it was very fun. It's it just it speaks to the openness and, and kindness of the community. In that uh, I sent him an email, and you know, ten minutes later he said, "Well, here's my phone number. Give me a call, and we'll talk about it." I said, "Wow, okay." <laughs> So I did, and we talked about that. I talked to John um, about some ideas, and John, who's a fantastic artist um, and whose um, uh, illustrator speed, I'm sure, is just fast enough now, even though he's been uh, working as a novelist, I'm sure his illustrator speed is fast, uh, had some great ideas about the art. And if it weren't for John's art, it would, it would be a mimeograph paper. It would look like a fifth-grade test that they run off on those purple machines. Uh, but John really made it look like a professional magazine. I had some ideas for how we put things together, and we've been fortunate enough to have some great, great authors uh, submit things, and we've worked with some. We've had some uh, been been fortunate enough to ha find some of the stories in the Best American Mystery series, various award-winning stuff. Uh, Chris Holm uh, was one of the first ones who really uh, hit the mark there, and hit one of the stories is he's turned into a, a nice novel. So uh, it's just it's been really nice to see all of those stories and authors kind of come together and, and push forward. So that's Needle Magazine, uh, a magazine of noir. Uh, so it's not it's not your Ellery Queen Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock. It's a little um, harder, uh, nastier, uh, more raw. And so that's kind of uh, how that started, and probably more than you asked. So John, how did you guys meet? I've never actually met Steve in person. I, it was just through, uh, we have this, uh, I think uh, all the authors here, uh, I mean, Joel, Steve, and I all have the same agent. So, and, sh and Stacia is, Decker, Stacia Decker is really good about sort of fostering a, um, uh, a stable of, uh, that, that is of uh, authors that have sort of a interwoven community, I guess. A team, and, if you yeah. will. Well, I want to say a team. Yeah, I guess it is team. They, she calls it uh, team the Decker. team Decker, right? Yeah, that's, that team was... Decker. Hey, you're John. You're the one that created our our logo. Yeah, I did. Yes, I did. I have a T-shirt with that logo on it. You do. That's right. Do. Uh, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Rock on. Very cool. So it's sort of through Stacia. You guys learn about one another's work online, and then. Uh, it sounds like Steve maybe had the idea and went to uh, John Jordan for some advice, and then you guys got rolling there. How many uh, uh, how many books have you guys done? You've done like a half dozen or so, haven't you now? Yeah, uh, uh, two or three a year for the past few years, so I don't think we've broken ten yet, but uh, another one's coming out here right at the turn of the year. Right, and I, I'm, I mean, because of my personal bullshit, uh, I had to step step away from being, you know, doing the design work. I was, uh, it was just too much for me, on top of the writing. And um, so, Steve's doing it, and it looks awesome. It looks better than anything I I ever touched. So. Following the Horner template. Well, 
Oh, uh, but talk about who's that artist, man? Uh, the guy who works for Pixar, who do, who's done a couple covers. That's Scott bad. Morris. Oh, uh, yeah, those Scott Morris. Covers, fantastic. Scott Morris, uh, Crazy Morris on Twitter. If you want to look him up, fantastic artist. Yeah, Beautiful he designed. Uh, if you remember Ratatouille, I think he designed the characters for Ratatouille. He worked on Ratatouille. That's right. Yeah. Well, let's toss it over to Joel. Joel, when did you, as an era writer, you published, you know, what about four? Or no, about eight novels now. It looks like seven. Um, I said seven. Seven. So, you know, if things are rolling. You just hit the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, you've got to be on top of the world at this point. When did you first realize that writing was a viable, uh, like, career path? That's something that you could do and actually publish books and and. Uh, at like what age was it? When you were a teenager, or your early twenties, or even earlier than that? I think that, you know, perhaps what I consider a viable career path and what other people might be, like, considering uh, a viable career path might be different things. I started out uh, as a music theater stage performer and opera performer. So uh, secure fields are not exactly things that I tend to go into. I, I seem to to embrace worlds that involve a lot of rejection and, and um, instability. I did not start writing though until I was doing I was doing dinner theater and I think I was 29, so I I never even took a creative writing class in my life. So the, it was a surprise to me more so than anybody else, and I don't know if I actually thought it was going to be a viable career. I just kind of wanted to see if I was up to the challenge. So what what was the inspiration for that? Do you I mean was there, you know, what was the context that sort of led to you saying okay I want to write my first novel here? Uh, I was doing dinner theater. I was doing Evita, to be completely honest. Uh, as she died, H chose a week. We were very sad. And the show had a lot of really unusual um, issues that were going on. Um, a lot of women that had some some interesting relationship problems based on their career. Or our, our Ava was a mom whose child, uh, one of her children was in the hospital and she couldn't be there with them all the time because she had to be on stage. So there were a lot of interesting women's issues involved in being on stage. And those kind of were around in my head when I got rejected from the next show. Everyone else in my dressing room made the show. I did not. And for whatever reason, I had an opening line of an idea for a book in my head. And since I was doing dinner theater, I had Mondays and Tuesdays off, and nobody else has Mondays and Tuesdays off, except for the people you just did eight shows a week with. So um, I used that time, and I sat down and decided I wanted to see if I could get to the end of writing a book. And no one should ever read that book, ever. My mother and my husband did, and I feel very sorry for them. But once I got to the end, um, I kind of wanted to know if I could do it for real, if I could write something that someone would like to read. It was Manuscript 5 that finally got published. Mm. Wow. That's, so it's, I mean, it was more than just, I want to see if I could do this. It was, okay, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to make it work. I, I tend to be a little bit freakish in that anything I do, I want to see how well I can do it. It doesn't matter... I, I, my husband and I were discussing tonight the difference in ideas of success, you know, whether the New York Times list is successful. To me, it means that maybe I, I, I might have a career in front of me. But, you know, every book to me is, is incredibly important and is a new challenge. And I kind of like new challenges. And writing a book was like the ultimate challenge. Can I myself get to the end of writing a novel? And can I make it interesting? So what are the ways that... Uh you did some acting in dinner theater, as you said. What are some of the ways that, that acting and writing are similar? Oh, they're incredibly similar. Aside from just in the field of, you know, I'm great at getting rejected. Uh, I'm great at, like, throwing myself out there in auditions and, and, and assuming that, you know, I'm probably going to get rejected and I'm okay with surviving that. But for the most part, story construction is so similar. Um, when you're doing dinner theater, when you're doing opera, um, seeing construction, getting the audience to come back after an intermission is, you know, kind of like, you know, someone reading a book at night and turning the pages and trying to keep them awake throughout the night as opposed to putting the book down and going to bed. So really trying to hook them, try to keep the energy high, make sure that there's no wasted movements, um, no wasted character choices. Uh, backstory, you know, you don't get a lot of backstory in shows. You get just little snippets of it. It's how characters re react to each other and what other characters say about your character really gives much more information than, like, you know, information dumps. So all of that goes into the same, you know, when I'm writing, all of that information kind of works for me, you know, all the acting lessons that I had. So while I didn't take a creative writing class, I had a lot of classes on character development. 
Hmm. It sounds like you learned a lot through those first, you know, trial and error novels as well. Yes. Um, while I wouldn't say my first novel was completely bad, no, it was mostly bad. I, there was enough there that if you throw a dart at a dartboard long enough, you're going to hit something. And I would say that there were a few good moments, and I decided to build on those. Very cool. Let's toss it over to Ben uh, with with the question about you know publishing as as a profession. Like, uh, when did you first sort of put it together that you know that, that publishing people's books was something that, that you were interested in doing, and, and what were the steps that kind of led to that? There was a lot of youthful idealism. The, the original Bleak House was born out of a philosophy club at our high school that we started, and when high school was over, we decided that we wanted to run a business, and we were 18-year-old kids who didn't know what a business plan was, or even what we were going to do, to be honest, but we wanted to have business cards that said, yeah, like this guy owns a business. And what we ended up coming to was that we wanted to have a self-sustaining multimedia conglomerate, and we were going to publish books, and some of our friends were going to act in the movies that would, of course, be made. And other, we managed bands that would take care of the soundtrack, and we got into the business of managing bands, but that was like babysitting adults who wouldn't show up to play gigs on time, and we managed a couple of visual artists who wanted us to promote them but didn't want us to sell their work because that was selling out. There was all sorts of youthful idealism, which is to say that in the end, we ended up just publishing books, and it was something that I was perhaps the most passionate about as someone who has always loved words and books and what a novel can do. And we dropped all of that other stuff and changed the focus to doing crime and darker literary fiction. And there was no internship anywhere. There was no... I don't have an MBA. I, mean, I have a degree in English and philosophy. So it was... It, as as much as Joel was just talking about trial by error, that's how we started a publishing company, and now it's 13 years after the first book that that we published, and it, it's been a an intense ride along the way, and one that has ultimately been very satisfying. What a great story! So, wow! So it started in a philosophy class. So talk a little bit about how some of these. Uh, larger you know issues of life kind of factor into the choices you make and have made as as a publisher uh, how does how does that I mean how does that inform some of the choices that you make yeah I I'm very big on presenting uh, and and this is not to speak ill of anything else but what is important to me is that whatever we're publishing examines the human condition, and I say that in the least pretentious way I know how, and it sometimes will always sound pretentious. But I, I, want, I want questions raised. I don't want, it's not really just about fast-paced car chases to me. I, I want the reader to stop and say, okay, if I was in, in this pair of shoes, how would I be? And I think that's born out of the, the, the sort of philosophical side of things and I think books books are able to either provide a great escape and make us get away from our life or they're possible it's possible for them to make us feel less alone within our life because we identify with the characters and we identify with the authors and sitting in in, in that who we are and, and what we are and all books are obviously a mixture of the two but I I favor the books that make you feel less alone as a reader, especially for people who are living lives that are outside of what they think is expected of them, that these are the people who aren't sitting, living the life that's drawn up in the roadmap, but have ended up somewhere that they didn't ever expect to be, and now they just want to know that they're not going to die alone there. It might seem sort of like a glib question. So why does crime fiction uh, sort of, why does that work as a framework for, for those kinds of stories, do you think? That's, I, think, I don't think that's a glib question at all. And, and I make a distinction between crime and mystery for, for me because a lot of our books aren't about the mystery. There's not a 
the DNA, there's not the forensics, there's not any of that stuff. And when I say crime, I like to take books, and Steve's book is a, is a perfect example of this. You've got somebody who ends up around a crime, and not all crimes are one of international consequence. The, the world isn't at stake in, in most crimes. They are localized, they are in a micro world, and they strongly, strongly affect the people who are in the nucleus of it. And the rest of the world just keeps marching in many ways. And the shock and the violence that comes with crime is something that knocks people down, and I'm very interested in how they get back up and how they continue to choose to keep moving. You know, I'll toss the question over to, to John that I asked Joel a minute ago uh, about, you know, the origins of becoming a writer. Uh, when I, and the reason why I ask this question a lot is I, I try to make sense of my own life, I guess, in asking the question. But I can look back and, like, I had a paper route from the age of 6 to 16. Uh, and so I kind of got a firsthand look at what made people interested in a paper uh, and not and how to distribute it. And then at, like, 16, I got a job moving at, uh, working at a movie theater. And then I saw firsthand just how lucrative storytelling could be and how it, you know, uh, inspires people, how it draws people to certain stories and not... And then from that, I mean, I, I distinctly remember being 17 or 18 years old thinking, okay, well, it seems like to me uh, story is everything. Like if, if you if you want to succeed in entertainment in a larger picture, whether it's music, whether it's filmmaking, um, even comedy to some degree, it, it all comes down to story. And, and then about the time that I got to college, I met some of my first, uh, you know, published authors, and I realized, oh, shit, there are actually people who are publishing books uh, and this, you know, is, is something that you could do. So when I look at my own life, I can kind of see the stepping stones that were there, even though I wasn't thinking about it consciously at that time, right? Uh, this is sort of the hindsight of, of 20 or 30 years. Uh, but were, were there things early in life, John? Uh, did your parents encourage reading? Uh, was, you know, was there something like that that sort of that led you to, to want to write? Uh, sure, yeah. Um... I, I live in Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas, and it's not a real literary um, hub. Um, I was very lucky. My dad was, you know, he's a weird guy. He's what you might think of as an Arkansan, like a male, you know, like a sort of corn-fed male Arkansan, but he was a lawyer, and he had this real um, love of Greek mythology Especially Homer, and um, he would he would orally tell me these stories of like Greek mythology. Very young, like well, some of my earliest memories are like you know, my father in a sort of country accent, talk telling me about you know the siege of Troy, you know, or or you know um, Odysseus's journey home. And when I got old old enough to read, uh, he read me The Hobbit. Uh, which sort of that was like my big first introduction to to you know literature and you know and then the next book he read to me was Dracula <laughs> you know and then showed me the Bela Lugosi film uh, so um, that you know it's all due to my father really I mean uh, the reason I got into writing I uh, when I went to college I never I wrote a little bit in high school. I went to college and got a degree in English uh, for the, the first time I went to college. And um, uh, I had tried to write back then. I wrote a whole series of stories in Arkansas, very much like trying to be like a Faulknerian about like uh, people who fought dogs, a whole cycle of stories in one county, Lone Oak County. And uh, they were, they, I, I think some of them were probably pretty good, but. A lot of them weren't. They were, you know, they were. Uh, they suffered from what Faulkner suffered from, which was like uh, in trying to use the biggest words possible, you know, rather than economy, you know, um, in love with the language rather than in love with the story. And after college, I I, I didn't write. I, uh, I stopped writing. Um, and you know, and life got in the way, and I had I met a girl and had kids and. Uh, you know, I didn't start really writing until 
uh, 2000 and uh, late two, in uh, National Novel Writing Month in 2007, I guess. That's when I wrote the first half of Southern Gods and finished it in 2008. And then I just kept writing. So, I mean, my, my sort of journey was sort of, you know, it was very much like, um, I, I can't remember which of you said it, but it was very much, I just, oh, Joel said, I just really wanted to see, when I started the Southern Gods, I just wanted to see, my ambition was, I love books. I just want to see if I can write one. And then, once I wrote it, it you know, at every, you know every, at every point, my sort of ambition grew. Well, I've written this book, now I want to get it published. You know, and, and so that's sort of the progression that happened. And then, uh, here I am. Broke and desperate. <laughs> Steve, how about you? Where did where did it begin for you? I know you got your MFA from the from LSU, right? Go Tigers, yes, sir. So, so yeah. when did when did you first say, okay, I'm I'm going to give this writing thing a shot? Oh, I'm still not terribly convinced you can make a living at it, but it's cute that other people do, I guess. <laughs> uh, good for them. Uh, it's it's just, it seems like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to try to make a living at it, good lord. Uh, no, I, I got my MFA from LSU in poetry. and uh, That's a really so secure I, field. <laughs> that was great, yeah. So, of course, you know, now uh, uh, I work in newspapers, so that's a... Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I really know what I'm doing. Uh, the, uh, the poetry thing uh, really was good because it helped, uh, it helped me focus on, on language and the sort of things that John was talking about, language for language sake, um, you know, I mean, I understand what he's saying, but, you know, I found it really interesting in terms of, you know, you, you break it down to just the, the smallest types of words, and this one word can carry uh, plot, momentum, character, all this sort of thing, and, and just this, these little little things like uh, uh, Ben's friend, my friend, uh, Raven Mack in uh, Charlottesville, who does these uh, great haiku, um, you know, you, you can have these little clumps of words and they can carry so much and mean so much and so in that sense I really enjoyed uh, the language and the words and uh, I, I really got to the point where I enjoyed dialogue and building characters much more so than say uh, a plot and I think we talked about this last time uh, you know uh, valuing plot and character over uh, dialogue and character over plot so for me it really started with the uh, uh, the attempt to see uh, how much I could build, how much how much weight I could put on these little pieces of things to carry stuff forward. I mean, the the book that I have out now, um, I mean, it's you know fifty thousand words or something like that. It is not a huge you know quarter of a million word uh, book. Uh, it's 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 got a lot of uh, heft on a very small number of pages and words. And to me, that's what draws me to it. And so when you talk about journey, my journey. I think stems from that uh, side of poetry, and that kind of carries forward in my fiction writing. So it's a, it looks like a weird path, I suppose, but even even journalism is trying to tell a big story in 500 words or 600 words or something like that. So it's it's a minimal amount of words, but it's 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 getting the right words in the right order, of course. How long did it take to write the, the series of stories that appears in Country Hardball? Forty-two years. <laughs> That's I mean, awesome. I, I, I'm not kidding. I mean, I heard stories when I was a kid. There, there are things in that book that happened that uh, my uncles and aunts told me, and I used that. There are, I, I got my MFA from LSU in ninety. Let me see. I graduated high school in eighty-eight. Got my BA in ninety-two. Got an MA ninety-four. So my MFA would be ninety-six. Um, yeah, so ninety-six, I guess ninety-five, ninety-six. Wrote poems for LSU which I've been working on, and some of those poems, when I was doing Country Hardball, I said, I want to tell more about this, uh, this community. So I went down to my basement where I had the poems from my MFA thesis, and I pulled those poems out, and I reread them and started reworking them into stories to try to, try to get another level at them. And uh, so, you know, it, it sounds, sounds like a, a stupid answer to say 42 years, but it's the most honest answer I know, really. It, it took me 42 years to write that book. Well, all of that experience factors into the stories, into the choices characters make and the lives that they live. What does your, you know, if you 
don't take this the wrong way, or do if you if you feel so inclined. But what did your family think, uh, your immediate family and maybe your extended family think when you're uh, majoring in poetry writing? Um, I, don't know. I, suppose, it, it, I guess it would be interesting to say that uh, they tried to encourage me to uh, study something where I could actually make some money, but. I think my, you know, my family has always been very supportive, immediate family, uh, you know, distant family, anybody. It's, uh, you know, nobody, nobody ever said to me, that's a terrible idea, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that goes back to the, uh, to the John Jordan talking about Needle Magazine, you know, nobody says, you know, that's, and I think, I think that's so encouraging, you know, that people, people don't, people see your passion and they see that you're interested in the thing, and I think if you're interested in the thing and, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a 20-year plan, but if you're focused on it at the moment, they will tell you know they'll say okay well I see what you're doing let's see how this goes I you know I, I didn't make a living uh, sitting in the corner office at a university teaching poetry to disinterested freshmen you know which is what I thought I was going to do but it, it's it's working out okay for folks watching at home this is Book Chatter Live I'm your host Stacy Cochran and we are joined on the line tonight by an outstanding panel of authors uh, and a publisher as well. Uh, John Horner Jacobs is the author of Southern Gods, This Dark Earth, and a YA series, uh, Twelve Fingered Boy, and the to be published Shibboleth and the Conformity, as well as a fantasy series that's going to be launching in 2014. You can find out more about John at johnhornerjacobs.com. Uh, we also have on the line tonight Joel Charbonneau, who is the author of the Testing Trilogy, as well as the Rebecca Robbins uh, and Glee Club Page Marshall mystery series. Uh, you can find out about Joel at joelcharbonneau.com. Steve Lotto, who's just talking a little bit about his experiences that factor into the crafting and writing of Country Hardball. You can find out about him at steveweddle.com and then Ben Leroy, who's the publisher of Tyrus Books. So let me toss this over to, to Ben. Uh, if you had to point to, say, three major milestones from the beginning of Bleak House Books to, you know, to to the present day, which three major milestones do you look back and say, okay, I can see how that sort of transformed me as a publisher uh, and, and this publishing company? The first one would be John Galligan, who writes Fly Fishing Mysteries, got reviewed in Library Journal for his first Fly Fishing Mystery, and that was back in 2003. And what that did for me was it, look at that, Weddle, <laughs> Weddle's got it. Thank you, sir. Uh, that that gave us the legitimacy. It gave me, as much as people talk about gatekeepers in the publishing industry, this was an established trade publication that we had been striving to get the attention of, saying, wow, this is a great book. And and I don't know if the quote is on the front cover of that, Steve, or if it made it to the uh, only to the paperback, but does it have a library journal quote anywhere on there? One moment, please. The uh, Japan Times, Drifter Story, uh, no, uh, I don't see okay. it. Okay, no, no library journal. Must be on paper, uh, yeah. Okay, so, so library journal's endorsement was a really big thing. Then there was, uh, in 2008, we got three Edgar Award nominations in the same year, and that was for Reed Farrell Coleman's Soul Patch, Craig McDonald's Excellent Debut Head Games, and Stuart Kaminsky's Short Story to Chicago Blues. <laughs> And this is called How Fast Can Steve Find Them yeah, on His Shelf? Steve, Steve, Steve the TV <laughs> librarian. Uh, so so yeah. getting the recognition of getting three Edgar nominations in one year, that was that was kind of awesome, and it made me feel like, okay, we've we've got credibility here, and we've got credibility in the industry. Um, and then as sort of a combined thing in the last couple of years, Steve included, we've had a couple of reviews in the New York Times, we've had reviews in the Wall Street Journal and the Los Angeles Times. And again, it's in some ways uh, meaningless in the grand scheme of things, but at the same time it's a great pat on the back to say, okay, you belong here, you have been doing something that you've establish that you have a certain line of quality and we'll acknowledge that and that's that's pretty meaningful that's that's kind of awesome at the end of the day because I want people like Steve to have as wide of an audience as possible and so when the New York Times says hey we're gonna give some coverage that's exactly my dream right there so let's talk a little bit about influences what uh, like publishing icons or editors or publishers uh, 
stand out to you as, as, as particularly inspiring? This is one of those questions where I show my ignorance. I don't have any of that, and it's not because I'm some sort of fist in the face of the industry rebel. It's just that I never paid any attention to those kinds of things. And it's been an interesting journey for me because along the way, I'll meet people, those icons. I'll meet the people that you're talking about. And I won't know to be really impressed that I'm meeting this person because I don't know who they are. And, and I sometimes feel like a fraud, like someone's going to call me out and be like, oh, dude, you don't belong at this party because you don't even know who these people are that are throwing it. But it's... Uh, it, it's Laura Littman once wrote in, in a book that she, she wrote a dedication or she signed it for me and she said to Ben the next Maxwell Perkins and I said oh, okay that's kind of awesome and so to me what that has always meant is that Perkins had a really close relationship with his authors and hung out with them and actually got them as people and it wasn't just a a commodity thing being pushed through and I take great pains to get on the road as often as I can and go actually hang out with the people that I publish and see their books and their stories and where it's coming from and get those environments even more so that when I go out and talk about these books I can talk about them not just as books but as a reflection of, of where they're coming from. I just got to hang out with Steve last month so that was that was cool. That's very cool. Uh, that's Ben Leroy talking a little bit about Tyrus books and, and some of the uh, milestones uh, that have led to to his publishing success and his career. Um, let me toss it over to Joel uh, and let's talk a little bit about writing conferences and writing conventions. What was your first writer's convention experience? Which which convention was it, and what was it like for you? Oh, wow. Um, well, I will say I'd never met a published author until I actually had written a book. So I'd always been a reader. I read about 250 books a year. They don't tell you that you don't get to read as much when you actually are writing, which is kind of a draw, a, a big drawback for, for me being a writer. But um, my, when I wrote my first book, my husband made me go to a, a writer's literary festival. And I met um, Susan Elizabeth Phillips, who is a New York Times bestselling romance novelist who used to be in theater. Turns out her son is a musician in the area that we know. And she kind of adopted me. And she made me join, uh, or she suggested that I join Romance Writers of America, even though I wasn't writing romance. So my first conference was um, a, a, the Romance Writers of America local conference, and I was terrified. Uh, I felt kind of like a fraud being there because it was, you know, Susan Elizabeth Phillips' local chapter, and half the authors were published there, and um, <laughs> it was the most welcoming group of people ever. You know, it took me about two or three hours to come out of a corner and, and actually talk to people. And uh, I didn't realize that I was actually at a, at a table talking to our keynote who was like, I think had been on the New York Times list like, you know, I don't know, 70 times or something with her books until about until she got up to do the keynote at lunch. And I'm like, oh, I was just <laughs> with her. Um, and I think that was the best experience ever, going to a conference and realizing that these authors are just real people. And since then, I, I haven't attended a lot of RWA conferences. I'm mostly at BoucherCon or Malice or, or different ones. But every single conference I've been to has been the same. Um, writers are some of the most welcoming, not all, but most, uh, are some of the most welcoming, um, generous people out there. And I am thrilled to be a part of the community. And I, I love the conferences. It's where I met Ben. True. Very, very true. I, you know, the thing that I've learned is that's you hear everybody's name online. We happen to be this internet generation where you can learn so much about one another through Facebook and you know, before Facebook through people's websites and Amazon reviews or whatever. Um, but there's there's nothing like actually meeting somebody that you've been maybe chatting with online or have known about on, you know, online and then actually meet them and have a drink with them and, and kind of see uh, see them for real. Uh, you know, it just it, it's for me. It's always sort of surreal, you know. I'll see somebody that I, you know, joked around with online, and then, you know, there they are at the hotel bar at Baltracon, you know, and I'm like, hey, it's you, you know. I need to, you know, talk to you. It's always a little bit strange. Uh, 
so John, how about you? What was your first writer's convention? What was your first foray into the writer's convention world? Um, uh, <clears throat> well, when I was a kid, um, I was big into like fantasy and whatever science fiction and and that there was a convention in town, and I went to it because it had my favorite science fiction writer, Larry Niven. And um, I was about, it was, it was weird, you know, in the seven, I guess, I guess I, maybe 81, I was a, a 10 years old. And um, my mom just like took, drove me down to the place and um, dropped me off, and I got in there and whatever. And it was sort of bizarre because it was there was a lot of pot smoking and, and uh, you know people drinking in the halls and it was, it was like a weird science fiction convention. Uh, my first one as a as like a wanting you know having a reason to be there was in 2008 after I finished Southern Gods. I went to Salt Lake City. I I'd wrote the book and I knew nothing about anything about publishing the industry anything. And um, I went there to try to, like, uh, see if I could find an agent or a publisher or whatever for this book I just wrote. And um, uh, I spent most of the time drinking and, that's, you know, and, and, and met a lot of people and learned a lot, but mostly drinking. And uh, it, was a whor it was a horror convention because um, – not a horror convention, a horror convention – um, which they are very different. Not that I have experience with either of them, uh, but um, so uh, it was. It was. It was weird. You know, conventions are a weird sort of. You know, there needs to be some sort of anthropological study on you know convention reality because sort of all rules are suspended, and um, people act differently than they normally would, and. Most mostly everyone is inebriated in some form or fashion. I don't know. It's, it's it was a very eye-opening experience. I, I don't think that answered your question at all. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it does. And I think the thing that if I was to follow up on that, uh, you know, the thing that's fascinating to me is that you went to your first one. And there was a huge gap of time before you were, you know, really an author going to one. But, but you experienced, you know, this this science fiction fantasy convention at what were you like twelve or thirteen? Did you say? No, I was ten years old. Ten. Wow. Yeah, I just went down by myself. My mom was like, "Oh, John, you like Dungeons and Dragons and reading all, you know, reading fantasy? Hey, look, I found this in the in the newspaper. There's a, a convention in the I can't remember the hotel, but it was downtown Little Rock." you should go to this. And, and I was like, okay. And it was like 15 bucks to get in. She's like, I'll give you the money, whatever. So she gave me like you know, 20, 20 bucks. It's a lot of money in 81. And just dropped me off there. And sort of, and I went in and spent the day sort of, and you know, I called her when I was ready to come home, which was like at about 8 or 9 at night. You know, and that was just, you know, back then no one would think, no one would think twice about dropping a 10 year old off at a convention and just letting them go. I mean, that's just the way it was back then. Yeah. John, John, have you ever told that story in long form anywhere written? <laughs> no, I haven't. And there's a lot to it because, like, the guy I really wanted to see there was a guy named Larry Niven, uh, is the the science fiction writer, who is a you know a, a you know a legend uh, in science of uh, hardcore science fiction. And he is—he was just an asshole. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, he is legendary of being an asshole. But and then, so after the 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 panels were done, which there weren't a lot, you know, this is in Little Rock, and um, it, it it pretty much devolved into like room parties. And I was just a ten-year-old kid. I didn't know. I mean, you know, so I was walking around the halls of I, I think it was called the Excelsior Hotel. Of course, uh, it was. <laughs> and uh, anyway, you know, uh, this, you know, trying to, I don't, I don't, I have no idea what I was doing because it was before I had, I'd gotten into smoking and drinking and partying. But you know, I, I, anyway, uh, it was, it was, it was a bizarre experience, and uh, it wasn't that interesting though. Um, 
in the sense that nothing you know untoward happened. I just remember walking in on a couple of folks in bell bottoms, like totally near sex, but they were both a little bit overweight, and you know they were both very hairy, and and just being sort of like, what the hell is going on here? You know, but, uh, um. And that was about the time I, I found the nearest payphone and, and called my mom to come pick me up. Yeah, I, I think, and maybe I'm naive, but it seems like writers' conventions have gotten a lot lamer and tamer <laughs> in the years intervening. Well, I don't know. Your, I think you have to go to the ones with cosplay and stuff. I have yet to be to to any of the, the science fiction dress-up conventions, but I, I know that they exist still. I have to say, <laughs> this, I'm going to chime in, like, as a horror fantasy mm -hmm. uh, writer um, those are the those are the conventions I normally go to because that's my audience and I love that aspect of it because you know I'll have a drink and suddenly it's like a carnival you know I mean I'm you know I'm I'm in this this area where there are know, stormtroopers walking by and and people in you know and, and, and while I could never sort of break out of my sort of weird bounds to do that myself, I really enjoy like having a drink and watching that happen. Um, uh, so it's 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 you should everyone should go to one at one time. The, the weirdest thing was um, I went to I was releasing my second book, uh, This Dark Earth, at, at a thing called Fandom Fest in Louisville, and. It, at, at the fa my, this Dark Earth is a zombie novel, you know, a sort of post-apocalyptic thing. But at this um, convention, they had the cast of uh, The Walking Dead, and, and uh, especially the guy that every all the girls like. Uh, I can't remember his name, but um, who? Daryl, isn't it? Oh, that's a character. I'm, I'm the 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 actor who like people are just dri are driving women crazy. But anyway, and I'll, I'll wrap this up because I don't want to hog the the airtime. But um, at the so there was all these people in like almost movie quality zombie makeup, um, with blood dripping from their mouth and and like just fucked up faces and just cr I mean like I, I I got in the elevator with one person in zombie makeup. I've written a zombie book. I was very, very um, not comfortable being on the elevator with them. In the same, the same hotel, the Galt Hotel in Louisville, they had booked a, a wedding. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, at some point, I was on the elevator with, and I had been drinking, uh, and uh, I was on the elevator with the groom, and I was like, listen, dude, I, I did. I, this is like, this isn't something I'm making up like, I should have said this. I actually said this because I had been drinking. I was like, man, um, you need to go get half your money back. Because, and if they say anything, all you have to say is, there are zombies walking around at my wedding. You know, I mean, that's all you have to say. I mean, it was, it, those people were just horrified. I think that would be a great premise for a, a comedy movie as well. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> I'm disappointed they didn't go take pictures with the zombies. That's what I would have done. Well, they might have, but, I mean, the zombies were, like, ridiculous scary. Like, they weren't, it wasn't even fun being around them. It was, like, people with, like, um, like when, when they put in the, the, the white eyes, you know, the white uh, contacts, like, it's hard to be around people with, with, with like, contacts in, uh, like, that are that ridiculously... Like into that shit. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's some scary shit. I'm like, your eyes are changed? I cannot talk to you. <laughs> no. Anyway. For folks watching at home, this is Book Chatter Live. Uh, that's John Horner Jacobs, author of Southern Gods, This Dark Earth, uh, The Twelve Finger Boy, and the soon to be published The Incorruptibles. Uh, we're also joined on the line tonight by Joel Charbonneau. Uh, who's the author of the Testing Trilogy, uh, as well as the Rebecca Robbins Glee Club, Paige Marshall Mystery Series. Uh, Steve Weddle, who's the author of Country Hardball, and Ben Leroy, who is the publisher of Tyrus Books. So, Steve, I've thought a lot about your answer to this next question since the last show. And I'm serious about this. Because there was such a... <clears throat> there was a difference in answers when I asked you guys this. 
Uh, but I asked the question, you know, what do you see as the role of the fiction writer in our society? Um, and I distinctly remember your answer was very different than, than uh, Mr. Rector's, John Rector's answer. Um, have you thought about it? Probably not. How would you answer the question tonight? What is the role of, of the fiction writer in our society? Uh, did the thing I say before sound smart? Because if so, then I'd say that again. <laughs> It, it was rather profound, I think. Hey, uh, was it that shtick I do about the meeting in the middle kind of thing? I don't remember that. No. <laughs> no what well, I mean isn't it, it, how it, it's not entertaining? Isn't that what the fiction writer does? I don't know. You're the fiction writer. It's, it, how much of it is entertainment in contrast to self improvement? Let's put it that way. Like if you had to balance the two out, is it 50-50? You're entertaining an audience. Is it you know the other 50? As Ben said earlier, <clears throat> you know breaking through the loneliness uh, that a reader may feel. I, well, you know, I, it's not you know like Charles Barkley says, uh, I, I'm not, I ain't nobody's role model. You know, it's not my job to improve yourself. But I think the contract that we take up as an author. Is that it's it's worth something um, in in this uh, meeting between the author and the reader that you know we've got to you know John does this he mentions uh, this dark earth which is a book I loved which isn't necessarily a zombie book you know I mean I read it uh, a while back and it was it's not zombies it's it's post apocalyptic it's it's how you find yourself in this kind of destroyed world. Uh, Joel's book, the uh, first Rebecca Robbins, it isn't necessarily just a mystery book. It's this great thing about her finding herself after, you know, with the, the skating rink and the mother's death and, and how she uh, fits into this community with all this stuff going on. To me, that's kind of what these books that we write do. They're trying to connect um, the author with the reader in the, the, the fiction that we do is kind of that middle ground. So it's, it seems to me that you know, we have to give the reader a reason to read the book and not just uh, entertain and, you know, show them a puppy and then kill the puppy, you know, like a, a George Lucas line. We have to, you know, give them a reason and have it, that doesn't have to mean super important stuff. That's one of the things that I detested about uh, the MFA for poetry is that every Sestina had to change somebody's life. And I, and I hate that, but it's, uh, it's incumbent on us as the author to connect with the reader and to bring them to uh, where we're meeting in this fiction and to show these characters who aren't characters, they're, they're people. And whenever authors start talking about their characters do this and the setting and the thing, it seems to me to be a sort of disconnect because what we're dealing with, what, what I'm dealing with when I write for damn sure is, is the people whose story I'm trying to tell and you are going to understand what these people went through. If they do terrible things, if they do great things, I'm going to try to bring you along at the same time as the reader so that you see what they're going through. Not just the thing that they did, but why they did it and why they felt they had to or why they got backed into a corner. I mean, it's important for the, the why and the how and the development of the thing. And to me, that's what's incumbent upon the author to show the reader all the whys behind the people in the book. That's what it was. That, that reminds me of what you said last time, and I'm paraphrasing quite a bit here. But it was it was reader empathy. It was, you know, part of the purpose of fiction is to uh, maybe self growth is a little bit too glib or, or too you know uh, contrived. But the idea is <clears throat> that you through stories can show people different lives, and yeah. uh, by seeing those different lives, uh, maybe develop a little bit more compassion and, and empathy. Well, if the, just, just real quick, in the, the book that I've got, Country Hardball, you know, you've got one community, one setting, but each person has a different life and they're in different situations and they're different people. And so, it, you know, as an author, you want to tell these stories so that the reader understands all these different people and sort of, you know, empathy is, is great. You know, you sympathize with the people, you empathize, you start to understand other people in other situations. You know, and I don't mean to say that that's the sort of thing that helps break down prejudice because that's a little too grandiose, but I think where we really fail as individuals in our humanity, I guess, uh, for lack of a better, less 
cockamamie term is that when we don't understand other people you know we see it just from our perspective and if we're doing our job as writers we're showing people from other perspectives does that make sense let me toss it over to Ben Ben what do you see as the the purpose of writing and, and reading fiction in our society I would echo a lot of what Steve just said and for me I've been fascinated by fringy subcultures and especially trying to find the voices of those people so that uh, the the people that you wouldn't be exposed to in your everyday life you have an opportunity to meet them and to see the world through their points of view and and also like Steve said these are people who are doing a mixture of good things and very bad things and we have to understand that each one of us is capable of of a whole wide range of acts and thoughts and impulses and we have different levels of impulse control and thought we're, we're able to stop us one of the one of the books that I published at Bleak House a long time ago was a novel called The Prayer for Dawn by a guy named Nathan Singer and uh, Nathan wrote about people who are way, in some cases, way off any radar of, of my personal experience of people around me, or the, if I know those people and they're turned to, the volume's turned to six or seven, like Nathan's cranked it up to ten or eleven and just introduced you to people who you're like, wow, this, this guy's doing some fairly reprehensible stuff, but you're compelled to find out more about him, and then... And, and this is a challenge, I think, for for the authors to consider, but also readers. It's like, okay, well, who am I reading? And I know a lot of authors want to separate their work from who they are, but you start getting into authors who can paint very vivid and what we would think are, are very authentic pictures of people who are way outside of our experience. And we say, okay, well, if the author is tapping into something that allows them to do that, where has the author's experience been? And at that point, the author becomes a journalist through fiction. They, they are reporting on the human condition as, as they see it and as we know it and, and passing that on. And it's, it's a profound responsibility that, that rests on the shoulders of, of authors. And I think Steve's work is, and, and he may disagree with me, but I think Steve's work is indicative of, of that kind of thing. Steve is giving... Uh, a view of, of people who are off the grid as far as who we see in our daily lives, but the people who have a voice that should be heard. But Joel, how would you answer the question? What do you see as the purpose of, and there may be, I mean, there, obviously there are multiple purposes, but for you, what, what, are, what, are the, what is the purpose of, of writing fiction and reading fiction? The thing I think is best about fiction is that nobody reads the same book. I mean, the, the words are on the page are always the same, but the reader always brings their own personal experience and their life experience and, and rounds out the story in a way that is different than somebody else perhaps fills out the story in their own mind. I think it's always interesting that that's, um, that tends to be when casting is, is announced for whatever book is being made into film and fans go wild because everyone has a different idea of what a character looks like. Not because the author didn't tell them exactly what the character looked like and, oh, look, the actor looks just like that. It's because they brought something, you know, the character meant something to them, so they pulled something from their own experience and colored it with that. So to me as an author, as well as a reader, I, you know, it, it's to provide a framework with some really interesting questions and characters that uh, a reader can then walk around in and, and kind of explore a different world through their own set of glasses. I mean, yes, they're looking at something brand new and interesting that you've given them, but they're still bringing their own life experience that gives meaning to it to them. So, I mean, it's kind of giving them a framework in order to be able to find um, meaning in something that perhaps they haven't experienced before and make it personal to them. You know, I, I can sort of run with that a little bit. I, I posted about this on Facebook yesterday, I think it was, or a couple of days ago. And even within that, for an individual reading a novel, a novel means very different things to you at different times of your life. Yeah. Uh, I remember reading something by David Foster Wallace 15 or 20 years ago, and he said, uh, that that basically what he was trying to articulate was that a novel is as much a reader's construction as it, as it is an author's construction. And man, I tell you what, I picked up On the Road by Jack Kerouac just a few days ago. It was on the shelf, and I was like, I want to read something that I haven't read in a long time. And I picked that book up, not having read it in at least 15 years, if not longer. 
and had visited a lot of the places that he's describing in the novel, and, and it's just it's a much richer novel for uh, my own life experience having visited a lot more places in America than I had when I was 21 or 22 or 23 years of age. Uh, so it's it's crazy how a novel can mean different things, obviously to different people, but also to the same person. It can mean very different things at different times of your life based on the you know, the experiences that you've had. Um, John, would you have anything to add to that? What is what do you see as the as the purpose of reading and writing fiction? Um, I, I guess um, you know I I would just echo some of the things that have already been said, which would be. I think um, the uh, reading, the act of reading, um, is well. I mean, most of the, the entertainment we, we get today is is the audience is passive. It's just sort of broadcast to your eyeballs and ears, and, and you absorb it. And there is no engagement. In it. I mean, you know, people could say differently about video games, but th there's a weird sort of um, thing about reading, which is usually you open a book, and I find this more and more every day since I, I, I'm having a lot harder time since I'm a writer to read, but there is a, a period where it's, there's this point where you're starting a book where it's really hard to get into it, right? And you really sort of, for me, I really sort of have to force myself through this hump of the beginning to get into it, then once I am, I'm within the world. And it the, the reason it's sort of work is because the, you know, there is a sort of covenant or a contract between author and reader which is um, you have to do half the work really as a reader you know uh, the author is, is giving you things and they're doing all the right things they can like giving you um, you know one of the main goals of an author is to um, assure you that you are in control of the story so that they can suspend their disbelief um, so it takes the reader some work to sort of buy into that reality that you're that you are putting out there. Um, so uh, I don't know. That's just, so the the relationship with books I think are important because you're part of the sort of um, collective dream that, that you know you as a reader you bring a lot to it, and I, I think. That has um, a lot of value in the sense that, um, that you don't get that any other way. There, there's like, uh, you know, we're so bombarded with music and, and, and television that a relationship with a novel is, is a long relationship. It's not just like 45 minutes, a TV show, or two and a half hours or, or whatever for a movie. Like a, a good novel is something that... that that, uh, or even a bad novel or a challenging novel is something that is an experience of itself because you are part of it. And I think that's important as, uh, for humans as thinkers uh, in growth. Um, but as to the purpose of art um, or, or the purpose to writing, I have no idea. All I can say is like what I try to do and what I try to do is I try to create a story that I would like to read, and I try to ultimately just engender emotion in the reader. That's really all, all you really can ask for. I mean, it can be an anodyne, it can be a, a relief from the um, you know the the drudgery of the, of our petty lives. It could be uh, something that challenges someone. I mean, whatever it is, it it, it is um, it is experiential. Um, by nature, more so than you know, than television or, or any other type of visual media, because those are all just receptive. You're just sitting there letting someone else's shit wash over you. But with reading, you are part. You are, you, you you come as part of the equation, and that's why I think people who are readers are far more intense about it, and far more engaged in it, and and love it more because. You know, they feel like they, kn and I think this is why a lot of people are disappointed when they actually meet an author, because <laughs> they feel like there is some s sort of connection between them, because there was a connection between them, but it was only in the book, but, um, uh, you know, and they get disappointed that the author is just a regular person, or, you know, a dickhead, or whatever, but, um, uh, 
anyway, um, I don't and, know if that if that you know, I, No, it makes a lot of sense. You know, that, it, it, the last comment that you made there, it really makes me think of, I, I just watched this documentary on J.D. Salinger. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Yeah. It's uh, not, not a particularly flattering portrait of, of Salinger, but... I mean, and obviously that happened a lot in his life where people were profoundly affected by the catcher in the rye uh, and then tried to seek him out. And, you know, he was just this guy who wanted privacy, basically, and wanted to be away from the world and uh, was not sort of this wise philosopher that, that people had imagined was because of the book, perhaps. But he was just a real person, you know, trying to, you know... You know, eat every day, go to sleep every day, and have a little bit of sanity and privacy, right? Yeah, so, that, that documentary is was fascinating um, in in the way that it captured Salinger and what Salinger's goals were. And I would, I, I would maybe even disagree a little bit and say that the dude was that profound philosopher guy, but wasn't interested in having 15-second soundbite conversations with people and didn't want the baggage that came with, hey, you're that guy. Because you're you're not really exchanging ideas on a level playing field if you're coming at someone thinking that they're on on that level. Very complex, dude. And and uh, Franny and Zooey and Ray's High the Roofing Carpenters and Seymour Introduction are hands down my favorite pieces of fiction that that, that have had a hugely profound effect on me. And I know that you run the risk of being ridiculed if you hold up Salinger as a, as a hero in some circles, but as far as writing and as far as my view of the world and my view of faith and my, my understanding of my place in the universe, it wouldn't be anywhere near where it is had it not been for the work, those works. I didn't, I'm didn't. i not a fan of Catcher in the Rye, um, but those works profoundly influenced my life. I cannot overstate their importance. Hmm. For folks watching at home, this is Book Chatter Live. I'm your host, Stacey Cochran. Uh, we're joined on the line tonight by Ben Leroy, who is the publisher of Tyrus Books, Steve Weddle, who is the author of Country Hardball, Joel Charbonneau, who is the author of the Testing Trilogy, as well as the Rebecca Robbins and the Glee Club Page Marshall Mysteries series, uh, and John Horner Jacobs, who is the author of Southern Gods, This Dark Earth, uh, and The Twelve-Fingered Boy. Uh, so we're coming down to our last few questions here. Um, and I got a few here. Uh, let me toss this one to Joel. Film adaptations. Um, one, have you had any interest uh, from from Hollywood uh, or from independent filmmakers uh, with a film adaptation of your work? And and then just as a viewer and as somebody who is a storyteller. Uh, by trade, what do you think makes for a successful screen adaptation of, of, a, of a novel or a short story? Uh, well, um, the day before the testing was launched, uh, Paramount optioned uh, the testing trilogy, so it's in development now. We'll see whether or not it actually moves from development to production. Your guess is as good as mine. Um, people always ask me if I want to be involved in it. I, I used to say no until I saw Catching Fire. And <laughs> I, I think that um, there were some, the, the, the author being involved in that movie, it was, it was actually a strong, you know, visual uh, adaptation in many respects, but I think that they lost some of the grounding things that authors provide. I think a strong visual uh, adaptation is great, but I think that you need to make sure that you get, you know, there are a lot of things that you get to do as an author to ground a reader in the world that isn't just visual, uh, to ground them in the character, and I think that sometimes... Um, Adaptations miss some of the nuances, and they or they assume that somebody has actually read the book, or they'll just get it. It's a companion piece. Don't worry about it. Where I think that films need to stand alone and be their own, their own piece of work. It can't just rely on people having read the book, or you know, hope they'll pick up the pieces eventually if they're interested in going to find the book. And Ben, how about you? What do you think? What are the What's the ingredients of a, of a prose story, a short story or novella or, or novel uh, that, that really makes for a successful film adaptation? I'm probably the last dude on earth that anyone should ask about any kind of movie-related <laughs> thing. For whatever reason, I, I am instantly put to sleep by most movies, and it's because when I'm watching them, I start thinking to myself, 
well, why did they do it like that? And what if they would have gone like this? Or I would have done it like this. And I've pulled myself way out of out of the movie. So I end up watching a lot of documentaries, and that's a... Uh, that's about the extent of my film, except, except, last week I went on a binge on Netflix and I found a whole bunch of silent movies, like the earliest stuff that I could find from the late 19 teens to the, to the 20s, and that was amazing because you were seeing somebody being given a camera and the idea of what film was and what could be done was a brand new thing, and the there were a lot of I watched a lot of Russian propaganda films I guess is what they would be labeled as and they were awesome they were awesome because there wasn't any way that I could say well I would rewrite this or I would rewrite that it was just capturing the actual lives of people who were living these lives and and that was that was it and so I'm not big on special effects and car chases and explosions and, and all of that stuff. I, I want a simpler, quieter story that will, if I'm going to fall asleep, at least not wake me up while I'm, while I'm sitting there. <laughs> uh, it seems like, Steve, you answered that question last time by, by saying character. It was, a, it was really about the character and, and their lives. Yes. Uh, as opposed to, like Ben was saying, lots of car chases. I think that's the same thing that pulls me into books as does movies. I'm not a big movie fan to begin with, but if I'm going to watch a movie, I want to be invested in the characters, not necessarily, you know, are they going to be able to shut down the bomb before it destroys the world or you know, right. seal the hole before Loki comes through. You know, I don't really care about that. And I think you said as well that there there was one movie, it was The Big Sleep, and there hasn't been another movie really since then. That's yeah, we, we just watched that again the other night. Man, that's a great movie. The Big Sleep, Maltese Falcon, Key Largo, Casablanca. Uh, you know, I mean, those are great. I mean, the, the Big Sleep for sure. I mean, when he's in the bookstore and he puts his hat up and the glass, just that's so great. Uh, I mean, that used I, I, uh, the, uh, I saw a recent movie that was pretty good, Memento. That was good. I don't know that there have been any good movies since Memento came out. But that one was all right. Fair enough. And John, what would you say? What What are the in ingredients that make for... Um, there's so many adaptations that, that work really well, and then there's some that just, you know, fall flat on their face, and I'm always intrigued by, you know, folks' ideas and thoughts on, on what makes for a successful adaptation or not. Uh, for film, I, I have no idea. I, I do like the films... I do like films that sort of... Uh, well, I, let me just say this. The thing I like about Netflix is... Because of the sort of limit, you know, you think it's just a bajillion films, but it's not. There's a fin finite number of films there, and you, I get exposed to a lot of films I would never, ever watch, especially foreign films. Um, and the foreign filmmakers haven't got the memo, like, about you know, the 3X structure and all that stuff. So often their films are quite different. Uh, you know, uh, especially like Korean films and Japanese films and and, uh, and Vietnamese films, and they're really uh, the the otherness of them really sort of engages me a lot more than like you know the pat you know American bullshit, which is just formulaic. And um, so uh, that I mean, just in movies, that's what I'm attracted to right now. Um, uh, um, but you know, uh, my favorite film I've seen in the theaters recently was a movie called The Way Way Back. Um, you know, I know I write science fiction, and fantasy, and all that shit, but I, honestly, I could, I, I don't ever want to see another superhero film again. I never, I never want to see, you know, anything with. Uh, like, my kids are taking me to The Hobbit, and I loved The Hobbit growing up. I was fanatical about going to see The Hobbit when I was a kid, I mean, or, or uh, about the book. And I'm sort of dreading going going to see this movie, which I have to take my daughter to tomorrow because it's her birthday. And I'm just like, oh, another piece of my childhood shat upon, <laughs> you know, by, <laughs> by, by Hollywood. But, um... Uh, and old movies, like, like Steve was saying, like, there is something other about the movies they used to make before 1971 when they sort of figured out some formula. Um, 
uh, you know, there's just something. The the beats are different. The the, the timing is different. Like in you know uh, you know you watch Lawrence of Arabia, which is just gorgeous. I mean, you know, any movie with an intermission, you can't have a three act structure in a, in a movie in, with an intermission. You know, I I don't know. I, I I'm drawn to those things more, and I, and I think. Hopefully, at some point, when Hollywood sort sort of implodes upon itself with all the reboots, you know, I jokingly said on, on Twitter a while back that in the future there will only be ten movies and they'll be remade every year. Um, but but uh, you know, um, I, I hope I hope that you know the public sort of turns away from that and you know the independent films that are doing. New things with, you know, story and I, I don't know. I, I I'm really just I, I I'm not getting a lot of satisfaction with with, with film right now. Um, but I'm also not getting any satisfaction with reading. <laughs> you know, I'm just like uh, it's like I'm I'm entertainment constipated. <laughs> no, I, mean, I can't I can't uh, you know scratch that itch. But anyway. So, Joelle, it sounds like you saw the uh, the most recent uh, Hunger Games movie. I did. My wife and I saw it on, on the big IMAX screen. She dragged me to it, and I actually found myself – I mean, I, we were walking into the theater, and we were meeting another couple, and they had taken two seats and hadn't saved two seats for us because you, you couldn't save two seats in there. And I said, okay, if I have to sit on the front row, I'm just going to go over to the bar across the street, and you, you, can, watch, you can watch the Hunger Games movie. But then I sat down and I started watching this, and I actually I kind of empathized with the character in the story, and I kind of got pulled into it that way. Uh, what were your thoughts on it? I think the acting in this movie in particular. I mean, obviously, I I am cheering for for the big young adult uh, movies to do well because part of that is is going to to decide whether or not Paramount decides to to put the testing on the big screen. And I personally would be really curious to see. What they see again, because somebody, everybody reads a different book. I'd be kind of curious to see what someone else sees when they read it, just visually. So, I, I'm kind of gunning for all of these books to do well. Um, I took my husband; he took me for our anniversary to go see it. I think the last movie I'd seen before then was like a couple of Disney films, and then maybe The Hunger Games the first time. I don't get to go to the movies a lot. I I thought the acting was brilliant, much more so than the first book. Um, I do think that, again, it's more of a companion piece novel in which they assume you're going to fill in a lot of the blanks because you've read the book. My husband leaned over to me on several occasions and went, okay, why does he have a locket that has her family's photos in it? Could you explain that to me? There's a lot of that that was going on. Um, But I think it was a really, you could tell that they spent a lot more money on it. You could tell that this was something that they were very invested in. But I think that Jennifer Lawrence... um, and the rest of the cast did a really great job of infusing these characters with a, with a lot of um, with a lot of emotion, and so that that uh, the audience could feel empathy with them and feel like they were right there. I think taking any first person book and turning it into a third person experience is an incredible challenge, and I'm fascinated any time that I see that kind of adapt adaptation, because it is such a hard thing to do when you're so grounded in the character's head, and then you have to see the third person experience, and it's it's an interesting process. Fascinating. Uh, for folks watching at home, this is Book Chatter Live. I'm your host, Stacey Cochran, and we are joined on the line by John Horner Jacobs, Joel Charbonneau, Steve Weddle, uh, and Ben Leroy. Uh, so our last question here of the evening, what are you currently working on, and, and where do you see yourself uh, in five years, four or three years, if you're more of a fan of the shorter picture? Um, and let's start with, uh, with Steve for that. What are you currently working on, uh, and, and where do you see yourself down the road in a couple of years here? Uh, well, I have uh, some different short pieces that I'm working on, and hopefully a uh, longer piece for the uh, the sequel to the same community that Country Hardball is set in. Um, and uh, so that's basically what I'm working on. And so uh, uh, three years, five years from now, hopefully I'm five years further along in this second book. I figure uh, the, I may have mentioned this last time, but the, uh, the Elvis Costello line, which says you got your whole your whole life to do your first album and two years to make your second. I figure, uh, you know, I, hopefully I've got a little more than two years to do the next. Is you know, I mean, John and Joel are masters at you know juggling a number of books at the same time. Um, I, I, they're uh, 
with me, it's you know if I get another book done over the next 20 years, that'll be okay. Um, hopefully, speaking of other books, Prayer for Dawn by Nathan Singer has another book coming out soon. So because I didn't pull this one before when Ben was mentioning it, I want to make sure that I got my points for pulling the right book. <laughs> Thank and, you, buddy. And speaking of Ben, uh, hopefully he mentions the uh, project that he's working on now on his website to uh, help folks with their uh, Christmas wishes. Because um, yeah, I think that's a really important thing that because uh, we're so often, uh, to, you know, uh, as people, we are just such absolute dicks to each other. And so when it's important that when, you know, we do things that are nice and helpful that, you know, it gets as much attention as possible. So hopefully Ben will mention that. Well, let's toss it over to Ben. So, Ben, what are you currently working on? Tell us a little bit about this. Uh, it's a, a, a charitable, um, you know, um, endeavor that you're involved in. Yeah, uh, I'm just randomly, um, the, the, the most important thing in my life is that, that I acknowledge that there are people in the world who need help and that I do something about it. And I know that there are other people who have those same realizations and want to help. So what we've got going on right now is, if you go to my website, benjaminleroy.com, there is a link that talks about um, there are a lot of people who have contributed cash, credit, uh, prepaid debit cards, and household items that are lightly used or not used at all that would be of value to people who might need them. People just need to go there, and if they need help or they know someone that needs help, they can put in a request, and it'll get shipped to them immediately. No paying for shipping, no paying for the item. Just we we want to help. And if there's a particular request that they have, they can leave a comment in there. We've already given someone a, a computer and a printer, and just trying to help out during the holidays. I am always trying to buy books and music for people too, because I think that it, it just makes the world a better place. Um, I am working on my own novel. I'm finishing up the fifth draft of that right now. So I am waiting to see how that, that plays out. And as far as the company goes, I want to land somebody on that New York Times bestseller list where Joel has just, just landed. And then um, I'm going to bow out, I think, at that point or sometime shortly after that. That's the last validation that I that I crave from from the industry as a whole, and then I'm done. Fair enough. That seems completely achievable. Hopefully. So, Joel, how about you? What are you currently working on, and, and where do you see yourself uh, in three to five years? I'm just hoping to survive tour next month, so I'm having a hard time thinking that far ahead. Uh, I'm currently working on uh, a young adult contemporary set thriller. I guess it's young adult. I, I, there's a teen at the heart of it, so I suppose they'll call it young adult. We'll see if anybody wants it. I'm fascinated by it. it. It's more of a study of human nature than anything else and what people are willing to do um, for things that they think they want and or need. Um, and uh, I don't know where I'm going to be. Uh, uh, singing, you know, on Broadway. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I kind of like another challenge, so I'll hopefully continue to be writing. I hope people will let me still write. I think it's hard to, in this business to um, assume that I'll have a career in three years, despite the New York Times list. I, you, know, you, you kind of hope that you'll have another contract, and at the moment, I don't. And John, how about yourself? Well, what are you currently working on, uh, and, and where do you see yourself in, in a few years? I am working on um, the second book uh, in the Incorruptible series, and um, I don't know exactly what the title is. I'm sort of playing with the title uh, Foreign Devils, but um, it's you know I have a real problem with like I don't I, I, I'm realizing I'm not really suited to writing series because each book I want to do something different, sort of a little bit creatively restless. So I want to be, I'm trying to do different things, and maybe, you know, it might, might have behooved me to sort of stick with, you know, the tried and true, but I am trying new things. Uh, in five years, uh, hell, man, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I guess my kids will be getting out of high school, or what my oldest will be getting out of high school then, so I'll be trying to figure out someone to pay for their college. And, um, uh, you know, as for writing, um, 
after I finish the last book in the Incorruptible series, I will uh, be um, I'll have finished everything I have contracted. Um, at that point, I'm probably going to just try to write something that pleases me, and it can be as weird and as intricate or simple or long, and I can take as long as I want to do it. And uh, I don't know what it's going to be yet. I mean, I've got a few ideas, and you know, uh, I, but I don't know. Um, I'm really sort of at a crossroads because I'm sort of like I've had enough success at writing to like sort of make a make you know to spend a year doing it, but you know I had this other career in advertising, being an art director and designer, and you know I don't know I I'm sort of up in up in the air right now, and so I can't <laughs> I have no idea where I'll be in five years. Our agent probably really loves listening to all of us talk about it, <laughs> not knowing what we're going to do. Yeah. Stacia, we love you. <laughs> well, I, I have high hopes and anticipate more success for you guys. And Joelle, you've just hit the New York Times bestseller list. The more good things are sure to come, and I'm sure everybody on the panel is um, going to say a prayer tonight that those things will continue to occur for for everyone here. Uh, for all of us here at, at Book Chatter, I'm your host, Stacy Cochran. Uh, I do want to thank our panelists, Steve Weddle, John Horner Jacobs, Joel Charbonneau, and Ben Leroy uh, for, for joining us on Book Chatter. Um, we'll be archiving this episode shortly, and everybody have a great weekend. Thanks so much. Thank you.